and drink to Ike. Geispark. Oops, that's uh, uh, recording. Um, uh, Geispark, who's the vice president of uh, strategy uh, in defense, uh, space, and security for uh, for Boeing. And um, I know that uh, Rick, uh, in addition to all the reasons that he wants to visit Fletcher, has now a new reason to come to Boston. So uh, Rick, uh, we will uh, we'll welcome you even more frequently uh, over here. Um, Rick, of course, uh, has uh, been at Boeing uh, uh, in, uh, for, for a long time and has a very significant role. He works directly uh, with the president of uh, BDS and uh, the uh, president chief executive officer and uh, the senior vice president and chief strategy officer and helps uh, shape the future direction of our business. And he joined uh, Boeing in 2008. And uh, when he first joined, he was responsible for analyzing and developing plans to drive the company's growth and nurture new businesses. And in collaboration with both the commercial airplanes business and uh, the defense uh, business units, he works to develop competitive strategies and key growth initiatives while overseeing the corporate strategy office. As you can imagine, uh, given his role in Boeing and given the role of Boeing, uh, uh, both uh, uh, within the United States and globally, uh, it touches on so many of the issues that uh, we uh, study here at Fletcher and we care about, uh, you know, both uh, at Fletcher and around the world. Uh, prior to Boeing, uh, uh, Rick uh, has had leadership positions in a number of uh, different organizations, uh, both in uh, aerospace and in management consulting. He was at Northrop Grumman uh, and also at uh, Bain and Company. And uh, which uh, office were you at? Bain? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Well, wow. lovely office. So it's a. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, you don't miss it at all. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, he uh, began his uh, professional uh, career service uh, uh, serving as a case officer with the director of operations with the Central Intelligence Agency, also known as the agency. So, uh, Rick, uh, a warm welcome to you, uh, to, to, to Fletcher, and a warm, warm welcome back to uh, Boston. Uh, Rick uh, got his BA in history uh, with honors from a tiny college down the road. Um, which we can see, I think Rick, uh, you, you saw the, um, your, your college uh, on, uh, on a treeless uh, uh, winter uh, day today, a, a graduate from Harvard and got his MBA from uh, UCLA. Rick Garspak, welcome back. Yeah, thank you, thank you, appreciate it, thanks. Okay, hey guys, uh, so thanks for coming in, thanks for, for dialing in online. Uh, I appreciate the warm welcome. It's it's great to be back here at Tufts. Uh, as the the dean was alluding to earlier, it's, I have another reason to come back. Uh, Boston, my daughter is a first year at Harvard College now, uh, so we got to go to dinner last night and kind of hang out. And it was nice to uh, to catch up with her uh, on campus as well. And I got to hear all about the snow uh, over the weekend. Uh, she had a good time. Uh, although I, I live in Chicago, she grew up in Chicago, so it, uh, it's not like snow is a unique thing. But it was. It sounded like it was a it was a storm that got her raise attention. We'll, we'll put it that way. Got her attention as well, too. Um, so it's great to be back. So we have been coming to uh, to the Fletcher School for about seven years or so now and working with the consulting class, which I know this is not, we've been working with the consulting class on a couple of key projects. Um, Rick, uh, I'm going to have you come a little over here so they're not looking at your belly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. There you go. Okay. So, um, Speaking to those in the room, see there's benefits to being in the room. That way, uh, if, if you want to come back to back to class, this is the place to be. All the cool kids are here. <laughs> 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 but if, you think, if you think this is fun, you can do this every day. Um, so, uh, so uh, Boeing. I've seen we were working back and forth with Fletcher for the last uh, seven, eight years, or something like that, doing doing projects that are of import to us, uh, and it's been a great relationship. And it's it's good to be back here as well. So, um, so Boeing, um, you know, we, so I run strategy uh, for our defense. There, there are three businesses within Boeing. There's the commercial business, which we all know and love, 737, the Dreamliner, and 747, that, that kind of business. That's all headquartered out in the Seattle area, Puget Sound. There's the defense business, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C., which is uh, my business unit. We make... Uh, satellites and, and uh, fast planes and helicopters and all sorts of things like that. That's the defense business headquartered in DC. And we're, we're the uh, 
the nation's second largest uh, defense contract behind Lockheed Martin. And then there's a services business, which is headquartered in Texas, uh, and that services both our defense platforms as well as our commercial platforms. Those are the three major businesses. Um, as, the, as the dean was indicating, I'm, uh, I run strategy for our defense business, but I'm a kind of classically trained strategist for what it's worth. And I'll talk a little bit about that for you guys today here. So I, I came up uh, after my time with the agency, I went to business school, and then I served in management consulting and did strategy. So um, I, I view strategy as a discipline the same way accounting is, or law is, or taxes, and somebody may be strategic in nature, but that does not say make them a strategist. Uh, the same way, you know, I, I, I watch law shows on TV, that doesn't make me a lawyer. So I, I think it's, there, there's a practice to it as well. Um, and I like to think about it when, when we're looking at how to, how to look at Boeing, uh, and it's, it's just good, good discipline, so that's uh, some stuff we're gonna talk about here today. So Boeing. Um, been in the news a lot recently, and, the, and I, you know, we come to you with some sort of humility and recognizing that we've had a, we've had a tough three years, right? Uh, it started with uh, a number of tragic losses uh, of the, the Lion Air and the Ethiopian Air 737 Max the problems, um, and, and tragic, just a terrible loss of life, uh, followed by a COVID crisis and a global pandemic, which has put a which has put a real uh, sort of challenge on thinking for for, for everybody. Uh, so our three years have been have been challenged, but I know they have been for you guys as well too. And so I, uh, I want to make sure I, I sort of acknowledge it's been tough for everybody, right? So whether it's uh, you know the mis you know an empty chair at a at a Thanksgiving meal or you know a meeting room or whatever the case might be, COVID's been tough on all of us. It's been tough on your family. It's been tough on us. It's been tough on everybody. So uh, we sort of know where we are on that. Plus you, know where we are right now. Um, our purpose, uh, our enduring purpose is to protect, connect, explore the world uh, and beyond. So we unpack that a little bit about what we think, what we mean by that one involved. So protect, so protect means protect our flying public, we protect, already on the first chart, okay, that's fine, that's good. Um, yeah, protect, connect, explore the world and beyond. I, I didn't even know I had it on a chart, that's good. <laughs> um, so that's protect our, our military customers and their allies. Uh, connect. Uh, connect is all about sort of bringing people together, right? So that could be about the the uh, satellites we put up, which allow us to communicate with one another. That's connecting. But more more importantly, it's about connecting people through our uh, you know through our aircraft and through our ability to sort of transport us around the world. It's it's hard for us to think about it these days now too. But transport yourself back a hundred years ago or beyond. The idea that I could have flown up here uh, yesterday afternoon had had you know, dinner with my daughter in Cambridge, talk to you guys, I'm gonna get on a plane this afternoon, I'm gonna fly back to Chicago the, this evening. And it just, that would have taken your grandparents' minds and just literally blown their minds. Like, what are you talking about? Are you in a magic time machine? What's, what's happening? Or you could have a meeting in Delhi or in London or in, you know, Dubai, all these places. And that's the real power of the connection of the both. I mean, I, it, again, it's hard to, to sort of put that into context, but that's a that's a real change in the world in the last hundred years. It's just the magic of flight and the magic of connecting people. And then lastly, explore our world beyond. So uh, that's another area that I don't take for granted. The, you know, we will be launching our Starliner, which is a, a crewed uh, a crewed capsule up to the International Space Station here in May. Um, and we're launching our SLS, which is the Space Launch System, which will be going around the moon here probably later this year, uh, and then taking the Orion capsule, which will bring, uh, bring uh, our first woman astronaut, we believe, to the moon here in the next couple of years on the space launch system. So when I say explore our world, I don't mean just on airplanes, I mean on rockets and on, in, a, in, in space. It's a pretty neat thing to do. And I, I, I um, you know, it gives me goosebumps every day when I, I get to see like that's kind of cool stuff I get to do at Boeing is, is, is connecting people and, and Sort of way. Um, there is a moment um, which comes up for me all the time uh, in working at Boeing, uh, which uh, is just terrific. So it's the time, I live in, I told you I live in Chicago, so we don't have a particularly big presence Boeing in Chicago. But there'll be a time where I'll be at a, a soccer game or a PTO meeting or a cocktail party or whatever. And the person's going to turn around and ask, oh, what do you do for a living? And I say, oh, I work at Boeing. And they immediately 
their, their eyes sort of, you know, light up and they say, oh, that's fantastic. Like, oh, do you work in, you know, do you build airplanes or do you, you know, whatever they do, this? they know, but it's, it's a neat part of, of, of the job is being a part of a global iconic brand um, and recognizing where we have been over the last three years. Um, I'm excited to be a part of sort of writing the greatest comeback in, in aviation history and business history. So um, that's the kind of stuff that we're working on right now. And that's what I want to start talking about is how we're going to sort of build that comeback. Okay. So um, let me pose a little what if for you. So I, I've got listed five strategic objectives on here. They seem sort of uh, probably generic to you guys, but let me, let me pose a question. So I'm running strategy at General Motors in 1962. So 60 years ago, I'm running strategy at the General Motors in 1962. I'm visited by a man from the future who comes back from 2022, and he comes back to the boardroom of, of General Motors in 1962, and he says, let me tell you all about what 2022 looks like, and I'm going to help you define the future for what's going to happen in General Motors automotive industry for the next 60 years. And that's fantastic. This is a great thing. Um, I'm looking around the room, and I say, well, I got a man from the future. He's going to tell me all that's going to happen. So what are some of the things that you think you're going to tell 1962 Chief Strategy Officer of General Motors in Detroit, 1962? So I'll, I'll, I'm going to go Socratic. What, what's one of the things you might tell 1962, Rick? It's going to be all men, by the way, because this is 1962. So <laughs> we're, we're assuming that it's, a, that it's a white male. anyway. So. You mean like from today? Yeah. So I, I, you get perfect knowledge of 22. We all know what happened in 22. We're, we're living it today. Mm -hmm. You have the chance to go back in time to 1962 and tell General Motors strategy, this is what you need to know to define the future for the next 60 years. Because that's what strategy is all about, right? Is, mm -hmm. is helping where to play, how to win. What do you tell? I Just give me one example. The next long-term down the road step would be an EV, like a few decades from now, but to start developing that technology very early on with electric uh, electric vehicles that's a good example right so so you go back and you say guys if i got an idea for you it's going to be electric vehicles maybe not today but it's going to come around okay it's a good idea and then the guys next to you like i don't even know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a hell of a court i gotta plug this thing in and it's going right. to like, like a lawnmower no 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 you mean that's bad okay all right what do you what's another thing you're going to think about what do you think i would say interconnectedness too so like gps for example gps mm -hmm. cars now and you know so you got better, so that's a good one. So in 2022, so 1962, guys, so you don't need maps. Is that one of the things you're talking about? Among other things, so the, the car will know where to go, effectively, or among other things, so. Yes? Uh, China's gonna have some nasty missiles. China will have nasty missiles. So what, what does General Motors think about for- Oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of, of Boeing. Okay, that's good. I like, the China does have nasty missiles. We'll talk about that as well, but okay, so. You got the floor though for a second. So what what are you telling 1962 Chief Strategy Officer at General Motors? Uh, start planning for it. I know you're you're not. They don't look like a threat now, um, but start developing the technology and uh, be prepared for uh, China's ascendancy. China's ascendancy. Okay, that's right. That's a good one. Okay. Um, any ideas? What What do you think? Uh, I might suggest maybe in the future there's a man called Elon Musk who wants to start like uh, develop the space link in the future so you might have something to do with that space link with just so general motors want to worry about space because elon Musk. <laughs> and, uh, another person <laughs> okay that's fine that's fine yeah okay uh what do you think uh, i would say microprocessing and microprocessing your technology okay uh because your vehicle is going to be more about the computer inside of it than it is going to be about anything else okay. at this at this stage so micro so it doesn't align microprocessing so it's sort of good. more electronics in the cars right okay. yes sir in the back i think also thing would be a major trend also then to, to china and other countries mm -hmm. lower level costs worry about china as a, as a market is that what you're saying i'm sorry uh, no as a like production center production center production in china or in other in other global locales right because at that time let's be on 1962 you're probably building in, in michigan maybe ohio if you know maybe or whatever but it's just centered in detroit that was the global capital of the automotive industry any, any, any other ideas yeah well, supply chain issues especially what was that? supply chain issues supply chain that's especially a great if the world has stopped for two years um, yep. with COVID, and yep. we know how that affected yep. manufacturing yep. and car auto parts. Yep. To think about that. Yeah, supply chain. That's a great one. Yeah. 
you, you were going to say an idea? Um, yeah, I would also just want to tell them when the economic downturns would be. <laughs> That's <laughs> really good. <laughs> so economic downturns, she'd want to know when the economic downturns would be. And you just be like, you might want to tell them like who won the World Series in different years. <laughs> 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 Horses that win the Kentucky Derby, like just saying Secretariat, uh, you know, <laughs> it'd be good. It'd be good. So the, the man from the future tells you stock picks, World Series, <laughs> horses, supply chain, and markets, and, and economic options. Yes. Anyway, so my, uh, so your visit in 1962, the person is probably going to talk to you about supply chain. They're going to say, oh, you know what? You might want to diversify some things you might want to own, some things you might want to decide you, you can buy. Depends on what you want to do. You're probably going to think about products. You're going to think about maybe an electric vehicle down the line. Maybe a minivan. Like if you could be early on a minivan, like that'd be kind of a, a, a winner. Maybe a compact car rather than those giant things with big chrome fins and whatnot. Big gas guzzlers. Like you don't even need to go electric. You'd be like, hey, if you can just get the thing to 30 miles per gallon, 40 miles per gallon, you will kill it when the oil crisis hits in the mid 1970s. Right? There's all these little things you can think about. You might want to think about labor. How, we didn't talk about labor, right? So maybe the concessions you're making to the UAW today, 1962, about health care or about retirement or about and other benefits packages. Oh, by the way, in 2008, it's going to bankrupt the company. <laughs> so like you're literally going to bankrupt the company. Yeah. So start thinking about the concessions you're making today because they're going to have a knock-on effect, which are going to be sort of insurmountable in 2008. You're going to go bankrupt. That's crazy talk, right? But that's... That's a that's a little piece of fact. The 1962 Rick would have been a love would have loved to have, right? Uh, what about new competitors? We talked about Elon Musk. And that. What about like Honda, Datsun slash Nissan, uh, Toyota? Yeah. Look, to say nothing of Kia and Tata and these other guys. But like, you say, oh, you got to worry about Honda. You mean like you mean those guys that make like motorcycles? Like, mm -hmm. give me a break. Like, that's going to be a problem. Like. Oh, yeah, that's gonna be a problem. Like, keep an eye on the Japanese. That's gonna be a big you know, be new players coming in. So I've got all this information. Fantastic. Thanks, man, for the future. This is what I'm gonna do. So what do you start doing? What's the decision you make right there in 1962? You're in the board member, you're talking to the board of directors and the and the CEO and the chief strategy officer. What's the first thing that you want to sort of take action? You know everything. So what do you think? Yes. Cost minimization. Cost minimization. Okay, so that's a good one. So diversification. Diver what do you mean by diversification? diversification? I would say more portfolios and maybe not just try to expand too quickly, like just gain a better footing where you are locally and then try to get into different markets later and not expand at a very fast pace. And also try to get into EVs and Maybe 1962. Even. You want to get into EV? Not, not a 1960s. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, but I'm, I'm talking. I'm, I'm 1962. So okay. Wait. Just cost minimization. Then. Cost minimization. That's good. Okay, that's a good idea. We've got an online from Gurab. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, Dorothy. Uh, if I'm looking at 1962, I will be looking at what kind of resources I have in house, and if I have resources who are more skilled in mechanics, how can I skill them for the software? Because when we are talking about the, in 1962, the car was still a mechanical piece, uh, a chassis on the four wheels, and I'm moving in the technology direction. How can I put more technology into the car? So I will be investing in the resources in, in that direction. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. You, you mentioned software 1962. That That's gonna be, that's gonna be, you're gonna have to do a little explaining of what software is. <laughs> But I'll, I'll tolerate that for right now. So just remember where you are in 1962, right? So things to think about. So cost minimization is good. Product portfolio is good. Do you got to remember GM? Remember, we're talking the biggest automotive manufacturer in the world at that time. You say, product portfolio, what are you talking about? Like minivans. Like, I, like I've got Cadillacs. I got Buicks. I got Oldsmobiles. I got Chevrolets. I got a whole gamut. Everybody's my, my market share is dominant. Um, I make them as quickly and as efficiently and as, as any, any other product in the world. I got mass production going on. Like, I don't really understand what's going on. So you got an entrenched player. This sounds a little bit like home in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm trying to draw the parallels. You guys can probably appreciate. But here's another question. So like, let's say just for example, that I say, let's go after that entitlement and the labor issue. So I, I, I hinted at that earlier. I say, you know what? Here's something I can actually do right now. It's not acute, 
but it's chronic. It's a problem that I want to address long term. A guy came back and told me in 2008, we're going to have a bankruptcy issue. So I need to address this entitled benefits issue right now, in 1962. So the next time the UAW comes to talk to me for a renegotiation of the next X number of year contracts, I'm not a labor guy. But let's, let's assume they were five year contracts just for purposes of discussion. And, they, and the labor union says, tell you what, we're going to have a cost of living increase every year of 3%. We're going to have healthcare go up by 3%, whatever. And I say, sounds great. I just got visited by a man from the future. And he told me, uh, I really can't afford it because in 2008, that's going to go down. So I'm going to give you 2% raises on all the on all the elements that, that you brought forward in tax. My UAW representative comes to me and he says, I don't know about your man from the future, but all I know is that my members want 3% raises on everything like that. And Ford and Chrysler have not been visited by a man from the future, and they just agreed to those three percent raises. So enjoy your man from the future because we're on strike, and you're in trouble right now in 1962. It's actually a real problem that would happen. I have perfect vision of what's going to happen in the future. I've even told my guy, "Dude, 2008 is going to be bad." He's like, "I don't care about 2008. I care about 1962, 1963." My labor union. And putting meals on the table and the healthcare they want right now, or the salary increases they want right now. So you won't even get to see 1964, let alone 19, let alone 2008. So strategy is about near term and about long term. Both. I can have perfect vision about where things go. Oh, we're gonna have electric airplanes. We're gonna have um, zero emission. This. We're gonna have digitally enabled uh, aircraft. They're gonna be able to fly autonomously and whatnot, like, well, you know what? I actually got to make it to 2023 right now. I got to make it through a COVID uh, pandemic, global pandemic. I got to make it through a max uh, you know, software crisis that actually tragically lost lives. I got to make it through manufacturability of a 787 Dreamliner problem I'm having in, in South Carolina and in, uh, in the Puget Sound. So I got to worry about the near term and the long term. That's my point. So strategies, whatever industry you're talking about. So I don't care if you're making chocolate bars, you're making automobiles, you're making airplanes, you're making software. You gotta do near-term things and you gotta do long-term things at the same time. And you know what, it's hard, it's really hard, okay? So, five strategic objectives. I've taken a long time to get to the strategic objectives. These are the, the ways that we at Boeing have decided we are going to, uh, we're gonna focus on and we're gonna win on. If I were talking to Lockheed Martin, if I were talking to uh, Airbus, you know, any of our competitors, they would also have a series of objectives that they're looking at in the way they want to win. Right? So like 1962, you may decide to look at cost minimization. That might be that you want to look at first. So GM says, we're going cost. Um, Honda may say, we're going to go with product differentiation. Um, who knows? Chrysler might have said, we're going to go with new technologies and and minivans or whatever, I think that was a good play by, by Chrysler once upon a time. You guys are all too young. I mean, that was a hell of a play by Chrysler once upon a time. Lee Iacocca, like coming up with a minivan, that was like mind blowing idea. So here are the five things that we, we think are mind blowing ideas. So I talk about safety first. Um, that has to be at the, at the this is first on the, on the chart for a reason because you have to take safety uh, as the most important thing by the flying public. It's, uh, you know, three nines kind of reliability. It's the stuff that I flew up yesterday. I'm going to fly to Chicago tomorrow. I don't think about it, about the safety of flying. You guys probably don't think about the safety of flying. That hasn't always been the case. That is always the case. In fact, we were getting in the Uber on the way over here from the hotel to here. And the, uh, the um, there was three of us in the car. We were all in the back seat. We're all kind of mashed in the back seat of the Uber XL. And the drivers put on your seatbelts because we were kind of mashed in the back. Like, I'm not moving to put in seatbelts. But I realized, like, you know, the drive from Harvard Square to Tufts was more dangerous than the flight that I'm going to have this afternoon. Real bus. So we, we all think about the magic of flight, but we take it for granted. I mean, you're flying in a hurtling through the air at hundreds of miles an hour in a metal tube. Uh, it's pretty cool. So, uh, but it's because it's safe. It's safe. Unmatched producibility. So everything we're doing, whether it's commercial, defense, you know, et cetera, we are still making things. I know it's not cool to make things anymore. These days, it seems like everybody wants to, you know, be doing digital this and digital that, but we still make stuff. We still bend metal. We still make rotorcraft. We still make aircraft, and marine craft, spacecraft, you name it. So we still make stuff um, digitally enabled. So 
digital design, digital engineering, uh, model based and engineering that says you have digital twins. So if you're going to do a tech insertion, it's going to be easy to do that much the way uh, your, your Tesla products are going to be able to sort of do software updates. Um, you do the same thing. You do a software update to a, uh, you know, a fighter aircraft or a satellite that once you launch a satellite, you can't go in there and sort of make a hardware switch. You got to be able to do digital uh, upgrades to satellites because guess what? They're flying tens of thousands of miles up in orbit. Right? Uh, sustainable aerospace. So here's a good example of one too, that we're going to get to in a second, where that probably was not on the chart uh, five, 10 years ago, right? But that's now, that's something that's part of what we're thinking about right now. I'm going to go into that just a little bit. Yeah. And then lastly, global talent and culture. So, um, you know, where we're going to get people, how we're going to make, so I'm in the defense unit, and that's largely U.S. based and our, and our sort of Western allies. But the commercial side of the house, I was talking about this uh, just before we got in here. In our commercial side of the house, we have got houses of engineers in Russia and Ukraine. So why do you think we have a whole bunch of uh, engineers in Russia and Ukraine? They are space engineers, commercial engineers. Any guesses? Why does Boeing have a, a whole host? Yeah, go ahead. You're going to... You go ahead, take a guess. Okay. I would assume it's lower cost of labor and there's a lot, lot of um, um, talent there. Yeah, a lot of talent. But why not, uh, why not India or something like that? It's kind of like a soft power move. Like soft power move, interesting. That's a good, that's a, I like it. It's, clever, it's, clever. it's like you, you're probably attributing too much too much thought to me. I like the soft power move. Like, like I'm just sort of geopolitical titan, but I like the idea. That's good. Uh, any other ideas why I've got Thousands of people in Russia and Kiev, the Moscow Design Bureau. And all that. Well, I, I'm not going to torture you guys for the answer, but the, the reality was is that uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in the early days of the former Soviet Union, uh, we Boeing sort of looked across the globe and were like, there is a ton of very talented uh, former Soviet uh, aerospace engineers, like a ton. And those guys are underemployed. Um, it's a cosplay, yes. but we can still get the benefit of that 24 seven sort of design that, that a lot of companies do in a lot of other functions, but this is critical aerospace engineer. So this is a high value ad stuff. This is not, it's not just a low cost arbitrage. I'm like, actually I'm gonna get the clockwork in my favor. So Seattle is gonna do some work, ship it over to Moscow or Kiev. I mean, it's gonna come back in the morning and it's continue to work on that. Um, it just shows that global talent and culture and knowing where there are pockets of people that do very unique specialized capabilities matter. Um, but on the other hand, so talking geopolitically, boy, that's a real vulnerability that I got right now within the Boeing company right now for commercial aerospace because there's a few things going on geopolitically in case you guys haven't been paying attention. I'm, I'm trusting that everybody in this room, in this building is paying attention to that. If you're not, you're definitely in the wrong school. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's going on in Russia and uh, in uh, Kiev for on, on talent engineering. But you know, depending upon what industry you're talking about, th these are strategic decisions you're making, right? So we believe we're a producer of things. So we want to work on making it, you know, faster, cheaper, better, better quality, all that kind of stuff. And again, it's aerospace there as well, too. I'll tell you about our mass producibility. You know, another vulnerability I got, speaking of Russia, because I'm talking to Fletcher. But what do you think another vulnerability I got of producibility is right now with Russia? You have to maybe. If we follow this a little carefully, yeah, go ahead. Uh, titanium. Titanium. Well, she's been reading the paper, sir. <laughs> titanium is a good one. So basically, the best source of the world's aerospace grade titanium. And when do you, when do you use titanium? What, who use, why would you use titanium? I think it's super expensive. So why would you use titanium? Do you have any guesses? For strength. For strength is one. Uh, yeah. A lower weight. Exactly. Lower weight. Lower yeah. weight. Those are both things. This is lower weight and strength. Those are both things. So an airplane, lighter is better, right? The, the lighter is better. So well, why don't they use titanium in, in, in cars, for example? It's way too expensive, right? But if I'm making it for a wing body joint or I'm putting it in an engine, super strong, super lightweight, that's 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 bonuses in, in the world of aerospace because it's just gonna give you more fuel efficiency, better strength, all this. But unfortunately, I mean, geopolitically speaking, a very large percentage of the world's titanium ore, titanium sponge, comes out of uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, and that, that neck of the woods in general. And boy, that's a real supply chain challenge we've got right now. So again, strategically thinking, your General Motors, your Boeing, your hell, you know, uh, Procter & Gamble, you have to think these things through um, about where are your vulnerabilities and, and what ifs, and where do, what do you protect for? So. 
Am I protecting for sourcing of titanium? Yeah, I'd like to protect for that, but like, what are my options? Am I going to build a smelter in the United States uh, in order to do this? I'm like, that's that's a pretty darn expensive uh, option. So anyway, but these are, I, thankfully, I'm on the defense side of the house, so I don't have to worry as much about sourcing of Russia. My, my colleagues on the commercial side of the house, they got different headaches. Although I like to joke, they've got the commercial guys, uh, and you can tell that if you ever run into a commercial guy, you can tell them I said this there too. Commercial guys, they're always worried about like, do I have one aisle or two aisles? Sort of like, should I go with like aluminum or composite? Like these are the big strategic questions they have to worry about. I joke. And I was like, I got actually hard ones to worry about in defense. I got rotorcraft and, and satellites and strike fighters and transport. But they just think we're war monitors over on my side of the house. Um, all right, so sustainability. Um, let's go to the next chart. Okay, sustainability. So 1962, we're back in 1962. There we are again. Oh my God. You know what? I'm in a different boardroom. <laughs> we're a different boardroom. I'm at the Philip Morris company in 1962. So does anybody know what Philip Morris made in 1962? What, what did Philip Morris make in 1962? Cigarettes. Cigarettes. Cigarettes, right? Tobacco company. Everybody in this boardroom, again, all white male, unfortunately. Um, is all sitting there having a big smoke, having a good time, talking about the future of tobacco. But we're here in 2022. There is not a single person in this building right now that's having a smoke. There's not, you know, in, in the, in the, we're not having a smoke right now. There's no ashtrays here. I mean, if I want to have a smoke, it'd be like go outside, walk 100 feet away from the front of this building and stand in a park, you know, shamefully by yourself and do, right? Or whatever. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what exactly the rules are. I can't, I'm not a smoker, but it's probably something akin to that, right? So it is now illegal, immoral to smoke, you know, amongst other people, unethical at minimum to smoke. And if you were to tell the guy in 1962, Magic Man from 22 comes back, like, I'm just at Tufts. There was nobody smoking. It's unbelievable. Like, what do you mean nobody smoking? Yeah, yeah, not only are they not smoking, it's illegal to smoke. It's illegal. Are you kidding me? That's the craziest thing I ever heard. But that's the future of aerospace to some extent. So in 2052, 2032, 2042, I, I don't know when it's going to be. Is there a future where it's illegal or immoral or unethical to do carbon emissions from an aero, from an aircraft? It's not crazy talk where they say, I tell you what, you get one trip a year, you could, you, or one trip a lifetime, something like that. You're going to get X amount of carbon allotment. Mm -hmm. And if you want to fly to the Great Barrier Reef and see the Great Barrier Reef, you better enjoy it because this is the one trip you're going to do, right? So, so with the Boeing company, should I be thinking about sustainable aerospace right now? Sustainable aerospace is about 2% of the world's carbon emissions. It comes from aerospace, in, aer in aerospace related by about 2%. And it's not just 2%. I mean, that's still 2%. That's a big, you know, that's a big number. Right? So what should I be doing about today? What do you think? What should I be doing about sustainability today? No fair look at the chart. Just think about that. <laughs> um, Knowing the end state you want to get to, start kind of picking picking objectives along the way. Yeah. To, to try good one. To yeah, good one. Good one. Right. So should I be building like a zero emission aircraft today? You say no. Who thinks I should? I saw some yeses too. You think I should be building a zero emission aircraft today? Yeah. I, I should. Okay. A prototype or something. A prototype. Okay. So how is, how am I going to go about building a zero emission aircraft? Like, what are some of the things that might go into it? I'm not asking you to design the aircraft, but if I get if I get an idea, make sure you get it right this time. <laughs> we own the IP here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a good point. Okay. <laughs> Quietly on the side. <laughs> so what what are some things I have to think about? What, what do you think is going to be a hurdle for me to make a zero emission aircraft? Obviously, the the cost of trying to transition from what to use it right now to something new. It's called Jet A. It's called Jet A. Kerosene. It's essentially kerosene. Or, or, yeah. You know, broadly speaking. So, I mean, ultimately, yeah. Yeah. in terms of to become fully sustainable, you have to fully transition away from use of pure, mm -hmm. pure jet engines. So yeah. perhaps something electric. Something electric. Okay. Yeah. So what's the downside about something electric? We were talking about this, we talking about this with titanium earlier. What do you think the problem is I have an electric? Batteries. 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 What, more specifically about batteries. Size and weight. Oh my God. Batteries are so heavy. And they don't nearly have the power, thrust capability to get yourself off the ground. Maybe it'll be hyperelectric to start with, something like that, where you maybe, you know, 
maybe have crews at electric, um, but maybe sort of like land, takeoff and landing is maybe, I, I, again, I'm out, of, I'm out of my legal a little bit because I'm not, a, I'm not a commercial aerospace engineer designer, but I'm still, you know, hybrid electric is coming into play. Is maybe going to be on short hops first and then a longer hauled later or vice versa. I don't, I don't know. But you got to be willing to sacrifice a lot of weight if you're going to be hauling around batteries. And the market for for uh, a battery that can that can move your Tesla around um, is a lot different than the market for moving aircraft. No, I mean there's still a lot of aircraft that involved, but we're not talking about millions and tens of millions. We're talking about you know. 30,000 aircraft over the next 20 years or something like that, in total. So uh, it's kind of weird. But anyway, sustainability. So is there a future whereby I need to start doing that now? Short term, long term. Same kind of things we were thinking about in 1962, GM, 2022 Boeing, we're thinking about that right now too. And the, the stuff that we're doing here is no, no real surprise. So, so fleet renewal, um, every new aircraft that comes out in general speaking, is about 12 to 15% more fuel efficient than the one it's replacing. So if I want to take a big bite out of fuel emissions like today, just put a new aircraft. The same way your refrigerator is more fuel efficient, you are energy efficient, your car is more energy efficient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing goes with an aircraft. So if you're taking an old uh, 727 or an A300, let's take the A300 out, that's this Airbus stuff, we'll take those out first. <laughs> those are the ones we don't like anyway, the big clunkers. Get rid of the Airbus stuff first, put in a Dream Runner, put in a 737 Max, put in the more fuel efficient only stuff. About 12 to 15% sort of benefit, boom, right after that. That's good, let's do that. But that comes with a cost. And the airlines are not too, they're like, dude, you know, every new aircraft they bring in, I'm, I'm all for fuel efficiency, but that's gonna cost a little bit. Operational efficiency, that's about another 12% benefit that I can make out of operational efficiency. What does that mean? That means maybe flying instead of pre, pre flight, uh, you know, so predetermined flight patterns, get up in air and where are the winds? And that, that doesn't work right now. The way it works is you fly from point to point across the world, across the globe, because they want to know what, where are you here, where are you here, where are you here, where are you here. If you had better intelligence, which we have on board, and better radar, real time on board the flight, you can say like, oh, I'm just gonna slide a little bit over this way at this altitude and ride the winds. And you can immediately get 12% of benefit of operational efficiency just by flying like in flight better. Rather than coming in to O'Hare in a certain way and like step, 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 you can fall down the planes, you come in Logan, you have these sort of weird, like you can feel it you're taking these little things. So if you just flew in on a more gradual path, that kind of stuff, Improves in, improves twelve percent. Renewable energy, um, sustainable aviation fuel is something we are putting a big bet on right now. So just you know, uh, biofuels, things like that, it's going to make a big difference. And then lastly, advanced technologies, just better laminar flow, better, better, better technologies, lighter weight planes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I want to put something in perspective for you guys as well too, just so you guys have it in your head. Um, if I were to drive from Somerville. Um, to Santa Monica, for example. It'd take me, what, four or five days? I mean, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm punching it, going the whole way, still sleeping nights there. Um, you'll consume about 140 gallons of gas. Just to put this in perspective, because you got to put this in sort of people perspective. About 140 gallons of gas from making that, that drive across the country. If you were to fly from here to, Santa, to Los Angeles, you personally would consume probably 30 gallons of gas at the same point. So you said, put it, putting in things in perspective, it's just trying to figure out, okay, what kind of problem are we trying to solve here? I'm not suggesting that there's not uh, an issue here. The same way you want to focus on the big hitters as a, as, a, as a globe, as a country, as a nation, as an as administration, whatever the case might be. So we are doing everything we can here, but we just need to make sure that it's all part of the overall solution. Uh, the next chart. Uh, defense. I'm going to talk defense. We, we, we can talk sort of you know, conflict, et cetera. And since this is the Fletcher School of you know, Diplomacy, law and diplomacy. Said, law and diplomacy. Um, so we got, uh, uh, I think about the diplomacy, less about the law. The diplomacy for sure is big on my side here. Um, here's some of the stuff that we talk about uh, that's impacting much. So this is the trends that I'm seeing right now within, within defense. 
right? Great power position, reemergence of China and Russia. This is no longer a near peer threat. This is a peer threat, full stop, you know, double period on double underline. That this is this is the this is the real deal. Um, the investments that the uh, adversaries in this case have made in things like autonomy, AI, hypersonic cyber are are real. So the Russians, I'll give you a bit before example. The Russians very cleverly. Um, I'll give you two examples. One of the things the Russians did is a little tip of the cap to them, strategically speaking. So you won't hear me say this very often. Tip of the cap to the Russians. They recognize probably some time ago that they cannot meet uh, the Western capabilities for a air to air for combat, sort of fighter on fighter stuff that's going to happen. They over invested. This is a strategic decision that they made. They said, I can't win that front. So what they did is they invested in service to air missiles and integrated air and missile defense stuff. So you, you may heard about the, the Turks and the S-400. It's like a battery that's sort of, that we got a big fight with the Turks about with NATO and Turkey and the Joint Strike Fighter. What that is essentially is like a really sophisticated set of missiles that can knock out fighters in the, in the, in the air, called the S-400 in Russia. The Russian uh, integrated air missile defense was really good and scare the Western companies as well. But that was a, they recognized, let's take an advantage that, that we might have and they made it. They made it cool for the Russian engineers to not just like work at Sukhoi and Mikoyan and and Antonov and all these old school like design bureaus. They said oh, the cool kids are going to go into missile batteries, which the American cool kids don't go in there. They want to be cool fighters. The Chinese spent a ton of money on uh, hypersonics and on uh, the ability to reach out and strike. They said, "I don't even need to win an away game. I want to win a home game." I want to have the ability that when a carrier strike group comes in and parks itself off the shore of the South China Sea, I have the ability to reach out and touch it with hypersonics. So you hear them called carrier killers. You mentioned really like the awesome Chinese. Those are, they're good. They're good. But what that does is by their investments in things like hypersonics, that pushes my carrier strike group further away, which then what, what's the knockout effect if my carrier strike group is further away from the shore. Well, now my planes can't get there because uh, they're if the carrier is further away and planes have to, they, you like to have a place for them to come back to when they leave. That's in general, that, that's best practice in, in, uh, in aircraft is you want to have a place to come back to when you leave. That's, I guess you can write that down if you want. So, um, so pushing us away. So a hat tip to the Chinese, good play in hypersonics. So the point is strategically they're making decisions along the way to say, where can I, where do I have an advantage? What can I, the Chinese said, I don't need to win an away game. I don't need to project my force uh, globally. They are a little bit now, but I want to win a home game. So, uh, US strategy. So space force, nuclear tried to recap. This is just consuming a lot of money. So people you know, jokingly call it space force and it probably got a bad rap for sounding a little weird when you talk about you know, space force and whatnot, but that is a real thing. So just like the Uncle Sam decided to say, hey, I think air is kind of a real thing. And so the, you know, the, the Air Force used to be part of the army up until World War II. Then they said, well, that seems kind of silly. It shouldn't be the army air. We should just have a full on Air Force. Now they said, it seems kind of weird that space is sort of a little bit uh, three letter agencies and a little bit U.S. Air Force, a little bit Navy, like, let's just have a Space Force. So space is, is the new high ground for sure. So space is a thing. Space is a warfighting domain is, is a thing. Um, Biden's recommitment to alliances. Biden's recommitment to AUKUS. Biden's recommitment to NATO. Uh, so that, that's a real thing to mind. Global uncertainty. I don't I think I need to, to you know, talk to you guys about, about the Middle East, about, you know, India. I talk about India. It's a good example of one. Um, India has cleverly, historically, played a couple of fronts, right? They uh, they buy a little bit of Soviet equipment, they buy a little bit of Western equipment, whatnot. They, they had a little bit of both ways, um, which was fine. It's, it's a sort of strategic choice they made. Uh, they're doing that a little bit now too. I mean, they're, they're probably buying more Western equipment than they have in the past. But um, as AUKUS, you know, which is the Australian, UK, US alliance is getting some, some traction. The Indians are like, well, Am I kind of on the outs with that group here? So maybe I should be hanging out with the French and buying some of their fighter aircraft here to just to sort of keep my options open. That's, that's something that's going on. That's something that a bunch of school people should understand. Like hey, countries are behaving rationally. They're just, they're giving themselves logical choices. Why do you think Japan behaves this way? 
Why do you think Korea behaves this way? Why do you think India behaves this way? Well, sometimes it's geography. I, we were talking about Russia the other day, and I said, well, if Russia just had a giant set of mountains in between them and Eastern Europe, some of this adventurism probably wouldn't be around because they'd be like, look, I've got a regional barrier. It's just going to slow the, slow the advance of NATO and elsewhere. But they don't have a giant mountain range on, the, on, their, on their shores, and so it makes them nervous. And, Crimea makes them nervous. Black Sea makes them nervous. North Sea, you know, the, or the Arctic makes them nervous. And there's other adventures. And I, I, I don't mean to speak down to you guys. You guys know, forgot more than I'll ever know about that. Um, competitors are doing stuff too. I'll, just, I, I'll leave it at that. But competitors, they have choices as well, right? So Lockheed decides, what do I want to advance? How do I want to be successful? How does SpaceX want to be successful? How does Northrop want to be successful? Same thing. GM is going to be successful in a way. Ford will be successful in a way. Chrysler will be. Honda, Toyota, Kia, Tata, uh, you name it. So same, same thing in the defense industry. So surveying the landscape, understanding what the competitors are doing, understanding what your customers want, understanding what threats you're trying to address, understanding what, what you're trying to do. That's basic strategy blocking and tackling. Yeah. Uh, and I think I got a last chart and then I'm open it to questions. So this was uh, this is a global uh, look at what's going on here, uh, Asia Pacific, Middle East, and Europe and America. Uh, Europe and America. So we've got defense spending increasing in Europe. Um, with the Middle East, uh, just as a as a as a space where we're getting less, um, you know, it was a drawdown on the uh, on the war on terror kind of stuff. It's just becoming it's just be, it's it's really all about about China and. In Russia to some extent, but all about both near peer and peer adversaries. So, um, that's it. So I'm happy to take some questions. I don't know if anybody's online. line. I've been yapping for a good 45, 50 minutes. Um, hopefully keeping you as entertained with, with stories of time travel and um, <laughs> and other things. Um, I'm happy to travel for the future or the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, um, please introduce yeah, I was going to. Thank uh, you. My name is Soumya. I'm in my first year with a focus on international security. Cool. And it helps that I'm coming. Just I entered this talk from a strategy and grand strategy class. So we were talking a lot about how strategy is constructed, right? Mm -hmm. um, one thing we spoke about is the most important, maybe aspect of strategy is diagnosing the problem. And mm -hmm. if you can't diagnose the problem, all strategies moot. Um, but we were talking it, about it from a more political, like how okay. countries yep. create strategies. When you listed your strategic objectives, you had your safety, sustainability, all of those, right? Yep. But from a defense perspective, mm -hmm. how do you, what do you think, what is your diagnosis of the, one of the main problems? Ah, because we, I think what came about a lot was um, resources. Mm -hmm. So titanium, yep. fuel. So I, I got, kind of got drawn into the more, uh, though that is the main problem, but I would love to hear. More. It's not, yeah. So uh, that's a good, good, good question. So uh, the question was really about um, diagnosing a problem as being fundamental to setting a direction for a strategy, effectively, if I'm, if I'm sort of hearing you right. Uh, when I was going through our five strategic objectives, that's at the Boeing company level. So that applies to both commercial and defense and services. And I'm saying those are enduring those uh, wrap around all the strategies that are going to matter for my friends in commercial or services or me in defense. So me in defense, yeah. I ran through a second ago, some of the elements that I think are playing on. I, you know, I, I was being flippant, but it's like, hey, look, I got a, a peer threat that's a, that's a problem. I've got budget constraints that we just, so in case you haven't noticed, we've been spending a lot of money on uh, global health safety kind of issues. I'm not, not important at 100%. We got to reinvest in infrastructure, 100%. We got to, you know, invest in diversity, equity, inclusion kind of initiatives, 100%. Like all those things, but I have a constrained budget, right? So, and oh, by the way, and I'm, I'm not advocating for this at all. I'm just actually stating it. Like we have an aging, sort of less relevant uh, fighting force and equipment than we'd like to have with with the emergence of pure threats. So again, I'm not suggesting that we dump all of our national treasure into the nuclear triad recap or into new satellites or in a new fighter aircraft or new carriers. But that's a choice we're making as a country when we do that, and that's fine. So maybe it's reliance on allies and alliances, et cetera. Um, 
And oh, by the way, competitors, as I alluded to just briefly, they got a stake in this game too. So if somebody can offer maybe an 80% solution at 20% of the cost, they can go to the warfighter and be like, hey, I know this is not exactly what you need, but maybe this will be a non exquisite idea, but this would be something that would help you in a budget constrained environment. So those are all, that's all the environment that I'm wrestling with. We Boeing, we Boeing Defense now, for me specifically, you're asking. So I've, I've said that's the series of problems. That's the situation. That's the complex issue I'm worried about. My answer to that is digitally advanced, simply and efficiently produced, intelligently supported. That's us. So I have decided Boeing Defense, I'm going to be digitally advanced and I'm going to be simply and efficiently produced. So I'm going to still make things and I'm going to, and I'm going to make sure that I can upgrade them and I can make them as digitally sort of clever as possible. If I went to Lockheed, again, my direct competitor, or Northrop, or Raytheon, or General Dynamics, or L3 Harris, or anything, some of these guys say, like, no, I'm going to deliver the, the best technology. That's actually not really my play, where I want to develop this uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, comms, payload technology, not to geek out, but like, that might be what they want. They're like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be, I'm still going to make things, a rotorcraft, you know, flops around, or a strike fighter. Or a spacecraft, I'm going to make them simply and efficiently and be very good at making stuff. And I'm going to make it easily advanced. So that's the choice we make. Is that helpful? Yes. Cool. Right. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So let's take an online question okay. here. Um, Gaurav, you've got your hand raised, and then um, we'll go back and we'll catch Adam next time. Uh, hello, hello Rick. Yeah, hi, Rick. Uh, once again, thank you once again for this insightful presentation. I'm a second year student, MOLD. My focus is technology policy, sustainability, uh, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. Before I raise my question, I will just uh, give a, free, a brief about me because it will help that why I'm asking the question. I was working in Manching, Germany, which is next to the Airbus in uh, Airbus headquarters, and I was responsible for Audi and BMW strategy. One of the questions that we were always asking when, when we were looking for the jobs in Germany, that why we are not going to Airbus, that, that is a question, uh, reason why I'm asking this question. As you, sir, said that uh, you were responsible for strategy and defense. And my question is, when you define the strategy, your, your strategy is not only to define how to make the best product for the, for the customer, but also for the society, how, how these products are going to serve the society. And the best talent that is going to uh, build that product. So now in 2022, we are always talking about ethics, autonomous. Do you also consider these ethical norms and autonomous when it comes to how can we make more society safe products rather than destructive products and how to get that talent which is not interested to work for Airbus and Boeing when it comes to defense domain? Uh, so that's, that's a sort of interesting question. Uh, so if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, it, it's uh, ethics, uh, you're talking about autonomy specifically among others, uh, and defense as a, uh, as a sort of macro industry, is that uh, in the ethics of, de of defense? Yeah, so for, with respect to defense, I'm interested uh, to, uh, to hear more comments on autonomous uh, weapons and autonomous uh, airplanes. That, and the second, when ah. it comes to the uh, attracting the best talent that is not interested to work for defense because they are interested to save the society rather than working on destructive uh, products. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I would, I'll, I'll immediately take issue with the fact that I, I don't think it's, it's meant to be sort of, you know, destroying, uh, destroying, it's really meant to protect. I mean, that's the reason why I say protect, connect, explore. Uh, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed every morning if I didn't think I'm actually doing, you know, what's good to sort of protect the world. I mean, I honestly believe it. I don't think it's not just not just words. I'm not I'm not doing it to wave the, the flag. I'm actually saying like, I think as a result of a strong sort of Western democracies, uh, the ability to make sure that sort of we, we can protect freedoms that we all enjoy. So I'm gonna just full I don't, I don't apologize for that. And I think that's, that's part, of, part of our mission. So, and, and I, I didn't mean to imply that that's what you were suggesting anyway. I'm just, I'm just sort of going on the record and saying that as well. Um, Interesting enough, so you brought up autonomous weapons. And actually, that's kind of a curious topic, and I don't want to pull on that thread for a second. I'm not sure it's what you meant, but it's actually very interesting. So <clears throat> autonomous weapons is a potential thing, for sure. And it gets really weird really quickly. And so uh, it is something that I talk about even with my team. So 
the ability for a weapon uh, once launched to loiter or to collaborate with other weapons to do targeting along those lines uh, starts to hurt your head a little bit in terms of like, well, is this ethical or not? And I'll just be honest with you. Like, and I, I talk about it. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's something that we talk about. Like, hey, if, if it was launched and it can loiter and hang around, it sounds, sounds very dystopian, but it kind of is. Like, you could, we have the capability uh, to launch and have the, the uh, weapons communicate with one another and be like, okay, I've taken on a target number one, which I think we all, we are all big boys and girls. We don't understand. Like, sometimes you've got to try and take out that target. It's a hardened bunker and we think there's bad stuff in there. That weapon then, in the old days, you, you drop a weapon, and then maybe another weapon might come on top of that thing because it, once it was launched, that was the target. Now it can launch. Another one can come in there and be like, hey, I've already taken care of target number one. Let's re, you know, orient to go after target number two or number three or whatever. It's going to have like sort of an AI to be able to recognize what's going on. But now I'm starting to sort of put on a munition the capability to think about sort of, you know, there's no man in the loop, uh, and we call it man in the loop, who's actually making the decisions. I think we're all comfortable in general with uh, a human being being on the end of the same way. And it happens all the time that I, I don't mean to suggest that the man is infallible, but I think we're more comfortable with a man saying, I want to take out this. Do I have authority to take this out? Yes, you do. We're taking that out. Mm, it's a, it's a, it's a war. It's not a war crime. It's like, I'm taking that out. That's a tank or that's a, artillery or whatever the case may be. But if now if I've, if I've shipped that thinking onto a weapon and it doesn't have the man in the loop, I've given it a series of commands, but that's gonna be starting to collaborate autonomously. It gets weird. And uh, where, where that line is, is something I think about. So I, I don't have an answer for you, but I'm just letting you know, like it's a good one for talking about because it, it hasn't been thought through. And there is policy within the DOD and the Western allies about like, okay, this is clearly out of bounds. This is clearly in bounds. But just, you guys can imagine, I mean, this is, it gets gray pretty quickly. And I'm like, where are we comfortable with that? So good question. Nathan, I think you had your hand up next. Thanks, Rick. Uh, appreciate you coming out here and talking to us. My name is Nathan Skopak. I am a GBA student. I'm also a recently retired Air Force Colonel. So I really appreciate your, your discussion here. Um, Thank you. One question I have is, you know, how does Boeing hedge against the fickleness in defense spending? Uh, you know, specifically, for example, F-35 versus the F-15 EX discussion right now, and how the U.S. government may say, we're going to buy 1,200 fighters in one fight up period, but in the next decide, oh, no, we're cutting the buy, buy back to 300, for example. You know, and especially in consideration with the next generation air dominance uh, issues with Air Force. Yeah, good, good question, Nathan. So uh, Nathan's kind of going a click or two down into Air Force budgets, which is a good idea because it's a good, a good example. But um, essentially what you get is the Air Force says, I need to recapitalize my fighter fleet. And they're going with, a, with an aircraft called F-35. That's what Nathan was talking about before. And, and the DOD says, yay, verily, I will buy 2,000 or whatever the case would be. And this fight up is what you talked about. That's just a five-year defense planning program. So that's just that's jargon for a budget. This budget says, yay, verily, we're going to buy 2,000 F-35s. Then lo and behold, uh, Boeing, who's got an F-15 EX improvement, says, yeah, but what about buying some F-15 EXs here? And so we sort of, we're, if you imagine like a, a bell curve, um, the, the, the bulge of the bell curve is F-35s. And that's what Lockheed wants to sell. We're kind of pinching them from the bottom then with F-15 EX. We'd be like, well, we can give you the 95% solution at maybe 50% of the cost. And you don't have to buy 2,000 f 35 Maybe just buy 1,200 F-35s. Or maybe buy, in my case, I hope they buy you know, very few F-35s. <laughs> yeah, just buy more F-35, buy F-15 EXs, which is a Boeing product. And oh, by the way, let me give you some of the sixth generation. He called it NGAD. It's a next-gen air dominance. It's like a new, cool, future fighter UFO kind of like, that's what you really want, Uncle Sam, is you want a bunch of trucks that can still deliver weapons to fight and some cool stuff to go downtown when you need to go downtown in a, in a really real, real way. So he was asking about the fickleness of the budget process. And, you know, that, that same principle applies for shipbuilding, for uh, rotorcraft, for satellites, whatever the case may be. 
So what you got to do, Nathan, is you got to make sure, strategically speaking, that you're filling an enduring need that you know they're going to want. Um, and are there going to be vagaries in budgetary processes? Yes. Welcome to Washington, D.C. That's how it works. But if you're building it simply and efficiently, you're building it with high quality, you're building it so that it's serviceable, you know, the products will still speak for themselves. So, uh, but you might, you might figure out ways to politically sort of insulate yourself as well, too. And I don't mean to be sort of you know, crass about it, but you're like, hey, maybe I'm making sure I'm building it in the appropriate districts, or maybe, maybe I'm making sure that it's, that it's, it's going to contain jobs in the right spots. I mean, this, these are all part of the calculus that goes into it. I don't mean to be, let's not be naive. This is how the game is played a little bit, too. Good question, Nathan. So, I got a question here in the room. I'll get to you, Rob, in a second here next. Uh, Rafael Jornella, a uh, one-year MA focused on uh, international security, uh, active duty Navy. So uh, one question I have is when you're sitting down to write your strategy, yep. it, it's not in a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. So you've sure. got what the customer wants, long future of what the customer will need coming down the line. Yep. You also have the added uh, shareholder value. Yeah, sure. How do you weight those things when you're, when you're doing your strategy yeah great question so you says Ra no that's right uh, Raphael. Raphael, yeah so Raphael asked uh, a question regarding uh the other factors that go into play profitability i mean we'll speak speaking more broadly um for sure that comes into play and i didn't speak about that as much i was actually speaking about the external environment um so just as important about all this stuff is actually what kind of skills you have and i didn't even talk about that but you know the internal look matters like what kind of capabilities do i have for example, just a for example, say I knew that the world of shipbuilding was going to be your Navy guy. Uh, thank you for your service, too. So I was a, a shipbuilding guy. And I said, oh, you know, the world of shipbuilding is going to be getting busters. We, Boeing, our defense contractor, we should get into shipbuilding. And guess what? We're not really a shipbuilding com company, right? That's Huntington Ingalls, that's General Dynamics, there's other people like that. So I'm a defense company, but that's a market that I don't think I have the capabilities to be successful in. So I could make investments, which would cost me a lot of treasure to go there, but I'm not sure I could do it successfully, profitably, et cetera. I should probably focus on the next gen air dominance, on spacecraft out of El Segundo, on rotorcraft, on you know, whatever the case might be. So the question is, strategically speaking, you need to actually understand your own capabilities, your own cost centers, your own ability to make a profit, because it's not a philanthropic endeavor we're doing here. We still want to be able to make a fair return so I can pay my people that, that they can, you know, my, my unions can still get the, you know, to do the callback to 1962 to be, you know, put uh, cars in the parking lots and people can have a good living. So uh, how do I balance it? Well, it depends, right? I mean, I, I'm not only going for the things that uh, are the most profitable. I'm not only going for the things that are, uh, you know, the, the, the latest technologies. I'm trying to balance all of that. And I also have constraints. If I'm, a, I'm a defense business unit within the Boeing company. And oh, by the way, if my commercial brethren are hurting, which they have been over the last three years, and, and that uh, machine has been slowed or stopped because they're not using 737 MAX or 787s, et cetera, that's going to put a crimp on my ability to do investments in defense temporarily because I'm still part of the same household, right? Same, same thing that's going on in your household. Like you can't invest in everything at the same time. So that, that's, that's a fact. Um, Rob, sorry, you've been waiting patiently. Yeah, hi. Good. Class of 84. Yeah. Class of 84, I like it. Fletcher 84, yeah, which means I'm now retired. But um, but I uh, worked for Boeing 29 years out of Philadelphia. Oh, um, yeah? Doing product strategy, technology work with Phantom Works. Um, good run. And I was uh, an advisor, I think it was in year two of the Fletcher Boeing uh, studies. Um, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that study went well. Um, my question for you is um, back in the mid nineties, there was a strategy guru. So Rob, hey Rob, let me stop you. Was that, was that, yeah. um, was that the little bird study that we did with Fletcher? I, you know, it, hmm. it was a NATO project. Yeah, it was a NATO project, right. It, it was very successful, to be honest with you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for helping on Boeing. Thank you for helping on Fletcher. Yeah, yeah no, it, it was fun working with the team. Um, so, so the question, back in the mid-90s, there was a strategist, Jim Collins, who wrote about visionary companies, and he, and he wrote um, long about Boeing. And the thing he specifically attributed to Boeing was what he called BHAGs, 
big, hairy, audacious goals. And at the time, he was citing the 747 as as a, a global BHAG. So for, for looking forward for strategy, what, what's the role of BHAGs, that kind of big goal for corporate strategy these days? Yeah, uh, good question. So I'll speak just to defense uh, for a second. So you say, what, what kind of big bets we make? And we, we uh, Boeing historically have made some big swings. I mean, the Dreamliner is a good example. That, that was a big swing. So just just for a bit of uh, context, you know, at that time, um, Airbus had committed themselves to going to the A380. Oh, look at that thing. It's the biggest, most badass aircraft of all time. Well, guess what? They're not even making the A380 anymore. Because you know what? Nobody wants a big four engine, big giant beam. Emirates notwithstanding to fly in and out of Dubai. For the most part, that plane was a bad choice. So that was a BHAG that Airbus made the decision on. They have the benefit of having sort of government subsidies, which actually really help them on, on some of those questions where they don't have to take the commercial swing you did. We took a big swing on Dreamliner and boy, what a, what a dynamite product that is. Um, but as a result of sort of the instability of the last couple of years, it's inhibiting financially speaking or constraint wise, our ability to probably make another big swing in the very near term here within, within Boeing relative to commercial. So we need, to, we need to get production stability. We need to get reliability, dependability back on it. On defense though, to Rob's question, um, I didn't talk about this thing, but we're making a number of what we call disruptive impacts. So I talked about Space Force and about it. So we are working right now to operationalize the Space Force. So trying to identify things that a operational Space Force, and this gets super classified super quickly, but you guys can use your imagination. What are the sort of things that an operational Space Force would want to have? Uh, Rob, rest assured, uh, we are working on it big time, like big, big, big time. So, because I recognize that's a thing. So that is a market which is opening up. That is a market which we Boeing uniquely can, uh, maybe not uniquely, but uh, we have some differentiating capabilities and skill sets, and I think we can win there. And so I personally am sort of spending a lot of defense treasure in that the space force space, you know, domain. We'll leave it at that. Uh, and then secondly, uh, along the lines of sort of the strike fighter business, uh, uh, felt Nathan, I think it was Nathan, Nathan earlier had mentioned uh, the F-15 EX, that's sort of some of the advancements we're making against the uh, F-35, but there are also ideas you can do for the next sixth generation plane, which is an area that you, you can rest assured that Boeing is doing quite well in that area as well, too. So I assume we're getting close to the top of our, our time, am I right? Yeah. Are there any last minute burning questions? Yes, Christina. I had a question. Yes, I'm Christina. I met you briefly at the yeah. door and worked with this team last year. So yeah. it's good to see you all again. So I'm an international business student here, graduating in a few months. And I'm just curious to know, as you said at the beginning of this presentation, it's been a really difficult three years, not mm -hmm. only for your company, but for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, in light of what's been happening internally with the 737, mm -hmm. obviously major revenue losses, probably even more so on the commercial side, but how has that impacted sort of morale mm -hmm. for your team, yeah, everyone's at home? And how have you worked as a strategist and as a leader mm -hmm. to really make sure you're continuing business as usual and meeting your goals? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, I'll just be sort of personally and blunt yeah. with you on that front is that um, the last two, three years, I, I've been in the defense business unit for the entire time. So I, I was talking about, you know, like, hey, people, you work for Boeing, that's so cool. So my pals, you know, that I, you know, that I hang out with back home, like, oh, you're in defense. Well, that's good. You must be sort of like insulated from this kind of stuff. And, and I'm going to tell you, like, I, I'm rich for 20, but like, it's just been really tired, just personally, it's been very tiring the last three years because more so than ever, and I don't mean to lie, but it's, it's actually, I felt the pressure of the global company sort of on my shoulders more than I would have thought. And, and it sounds terrible, but like, being personal with you guys, saying like, feeling like I have to hit my mark all the time in defense, knowing that the company is in a very fragile or was in a very fragile state, uh, certainly for a while, and knowing that the defense business was healthy, um, put a lot of stress on me and, and put in uh, just feeling the weight of the company is sort of a little bit more on my shoulders than I might have been in the past, um, which is a good lesson, I think, for whatever you're doing and realizing like, it can get you for a while, but then I also, to your point, have to make sure that I'm keeping my team uh, morale up and trying to get them to rally behind the troops and saying, hey, here we are in 2022. I'm starting to see green shoots on commercial, but you know what? I still got a pretty decent hill to climb, and I can't let everybody fall down at the time when I've got a, a pretty easy hill to climb. 
So trying to find ways to rally and, and even dumb things last week, I brought in pizza for the team. Like we had like a massive pizza party here at my DC office. We have other offices around the world, but DC is like, let's get together for pizza. Yeah. Like, you know, let's, let's get together for beers and a happy hour. I'm just trying to do morale things. And I'm joking about coming into the office, but for us, for me and my strategy function, um, boy, there's nothing that beats sort of the personal interaction, getting back in there and just going to the whiteboard together and working on stuff together. So um, that's probably a little more narrow than you meant it, but, uh, no, but that applies for every other leader within the Boeing company, right? Whether they're running supply chain or operations or engineering or IT or finance, they also have to make decisions with their team and their function and their capabilities to, to recognize that we're still human beings and people and we, we still crave We've had a tough three years. Everybody is. Two years for everybody. Three for Bones. So, anyway, thanks for the question. Thank you. I think I also want to shout out to Adam. Adam, are you still there? You had a question about Boeing. What is Boeing doing to counter China's industrial policy and competition? And I didn't want to leave you out. Um, Adam, do you want to contextualize that? I think given the time, I mean, that's a big topic, Rick. I mean, your, your conversation has been really helpful. <laughs> I'm Adam Barbina, Fletcher Dude, 17. Yeah, I will, we'll, we'll skip over, but China is complicated. But China's complicated. <laughs> so China's complicated because guess what? China's also my biggest commercial customer. Yeah. Full yeah. stop. It, oh, by the way, at the same time, it's a defense, you know, uh, pure threat. So it's complicated. But that's a good question. <laughs> Thanks. So on that note, I want to thank uh, Rick for basically being an incredible fighter pilot. He helicoptered up. So like, you know, however high they go, and then you were able to go down into like literally ground level and kind of hover everywhere in between, cool. giving us a great perspective. We're so delighted that Boeing is a partner to, to Fletcher, and then we get to work on any of these challenging yep. issues and to help give a third party independent Fletcher view on these very important topics. And we have a team that's going to be working on a great project this year. So thank you once again, and we're going to give you some. Yeah. Everybody online, too, you guys are yes. good, good participants. Thanks online. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we'll see you here in person real next year, okay? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.